Hi, friend. Thanks for joining me. Uh, it's glad to be here, Tassim. Thank you for the invitation. Yes, my pleasure. I've been uh, reading, I've read three out of four of your books in the last in the last month or so and just been devouring them. So it's, it's yeah. been a real treat to read them and I've been very excited to have this conversation. So, um, Thank so you. just to you begin, honor. yeah. Uh, so just to begin, I'd love to hear you share your background and, and really your life story, anything that you'd like to share about yourself biographically and, and your story. Basically, I made my living as a university professor at a modest university in Northeast Ohio. I'm a professor of religious studies. Uh, my background is I have a degree in Notre Dame in theology from Notre Dame and New Testament criticism in Cambridge and a PhD in uh, philosophy of religion from Brown. And so I'm very classically educated, raised in the deep south coming from Mississippi. Uh, but when I finished my graduate training and came to Youngstown State University, where I taught for 33 years, I met the work of Stanislav Grof, of course, one of the foremost authorities in the psychedelic, uh, integra integrating psychedelics into psychotherapy. And his work was a turning point in my life. So at that point, uh, I continued to do my work and I've just made my living week in, week out, year in, year out in the classroom doing the things that professors do. But in my personal life and my private life, I began a 20 year journey working with high doses of LSD in a therapeutic protocol pioneered by Stan and other early researchers, exploring the deep structure, not only of my own consciousness, but of the consciousness of the universe itself. At least that's my understanding of, that's my best interpretation of where I went. So after holding that material and sitting on it for 20 years, I, I did this work for 20 years between 1979 and 1999. And I sat on it and crunched it and digested it for another 20 years before releasing LSD in the Mind of the Universe, the, the story of that journey. So basically, I'm a university professor who's part of the underground psychedelic movement in this country. Beautiful. It's, it's been an incredible journey to learn about, and I appreciate you sharing it. Um, I, you know, you allude to a few, in a few points to kind of who you were before you started this journey and your younger self. And I, I forget exactly how you put it, but but sort of like, uh, you know, you might not have expected me to go down this journey. And I was sort of, I got the, oh, yeah. that picture of you as sort of like straight laced and sort of like uh, analytical. Quite. What were you like at that time uh, before you started all this? Well, I began my life uh, seeking to be a Catholic priest. I was in the seminary in high school um from three years of high school and got a degree in theology from notre dame so i began very conventional um and at the same time by the time i finished graduate school uh, because of all my education that i had acquired i became an atheistically inclined agnostic basically the study of philosophy of religion and science had basically wiped my theological slate clean and I became a pretty hard and fast um, agnostic. Uh, and that's the way I began this work. And it was the LSD work that opened me up to a broader understanding of existence. Now I've been a meditator all my life since college. And I've practiced within different Buddhist traditions within the the Pasina tradition and Zen tradition and eventually settling into the Vajrayana tradition. But that all came after um, the psychedelic work. Well, I started meditating beforehand, but the evolution to more specific Buddhist lineages uh, came after the psychedelic work had begun. Mm. And I've raised, you know, three kids, been married, you know, mortgages, standard kind of affair, you know, and you know me, look at me. I mean, I look like an accountant, you know, I kind of, I was designed to be an undercover agent for psychedelics. <laughs> wow. I love that description. Uh, uh, what, what was it that so captured you about Groff's work when you encountered it? Oh, uh, 
Well, I immediately saw that if what he was saying was correct, this had enormous implications for philosophy, which was my interest, not just for healing and, and clinical psychology, but here was the method that allowed us to get deep firsthand access to dimensions of consciousness and through those dimensions of consciousness, dimensions of reality that um, I had seen described in many spiritual liter bodies of literature, but here was a, a protocol that allow people to be initiated, if only on a temporary basis, because this is a, a path, what I call the path of temporary immersion. And we have to be really careful not to confuse a path of temporary immersion from the, what I would call the, the path of abiding presence, the more contemplative meditational path. But it gave us temporary access to states of consciousness far beyond our ordinary egoic awareness and far beyond space-time awareness to explore the deep structure of the universe itself. This has been a philosopher's dream in a way, and particularly in our culture, which was is materialist in its metaphysical convictions, which has come to believe that there is nothing in the universe outside what can be explained by its material substrate, that matter is the only thing that's real, matter is the only thing that exists. And here was a method that was challenging that assumption, gave us experiences that would be, might be very difficult to explain in terms of that materialist hypothesis. So that's, that immediately um, picked up my philosopher's ears. Hmm. I'm not quite sure how to ask this question, but when you, decided to go on this journey and you know were inspired by Groff and wanted to adapt his protocol for your own use what did what did that look like practically for you what what how did you embark on that oh i i followed a very strict protocol and it's one of the things that i think that made my work a little unusual over the years it came uh, when you work in a therapeutic protocol you are totally isolated from the world. You don't take psychedelics and go for a walk in the woods or go to a Grateful Dead concert or even stay up talking with friends. You're totally isolated from the world. You're protected by a sitter who manages all the logistics of your day, handling the music. You're listening to carefully curated music with headphones and eye shades. You basically, like in a meditation retreat, you turn your attention totally within. And psychedelics are an amplifier. They amplify the condition of your unconscious and it causes subtle levels of, of your mind, which you might, or you have to really reach to be able to have access to them. It allows those subtle dimensions of your mind to come forward. And if you meet them in a very conscientious, focused manner, then a cleaning process begins, a healing process, a confrontational and therapeutic engagement process begins. But you're totally isolated. So basically, it's, a, it's an entire weekend agenda. If I'm working on Saturday, which I usually do, I'd start in the early morning, would last all day until after supper time. You, you're spending days beforehand. That there's protocols that you do beforehand. A lot of preparation of your body, a lot of preparation of, of your diet and of your spiritual practice. There's certain spiritual practice I would do before uh, a session and spiritual track practices I would do after a session eventually. Uh, so it's one very intense day followed by several days before and after preparation. Uh, and, and you know, it's, it's a several day commitment each session. I did, I chose after several medium dose sessions, I chose to work at very high levels uh, using psychedelic therapy, not low dose psycholytic therapy. This is a protocol that I don't recommend today. Uh, it's not that I'm against occasional high doses of LSD, but this consistent working, this exploding consciousness so violently or so aggressively is a protocol that I really don't encourage today. But I worked at 500 to 600 micrograms for 73 sessions in 20 years. And on average, that came out to about five sessions a year. I worked for four years. I took six year hiatus, and then I worked in a very aggressive 10 years. 
So it worked out to about five sessions a year. Can you explain the difference between psychedelic and psycholytic uh, protocols? Yeah. A psycholytic protocol is a low dose protocol where, which stimulates the unconscious more gently and allows, it sort of peels the unconscious layer by layer. Uh, and so layers of your trauma or anything you're holding, which is problematic or uncomfortable for you, surfaces in smaller increments, layer by layer. If you work with high doses of LSD in the early years, these were limited to three sessions. The, the work at, that Stan did at Spring Grove Hospital in Baltimore was working with terminally ill cancer patients who were dealing with death anxiety. And what they were trying to do was to precipitate a something approximating a near death experience to give these people who were dying a bit of a glimpse, a foretaste of where they were going when they died. Um, so it's a very powerful, a much more uh, evocative state. Instead of processing all the individual layers of the personal psyche, it tends to blow through those and drive consciousness into a more radical state of awareness. So what I did was I thought, well, if you could do this work safely three times, you could do it safely more than three times. And I was still thinking in the early years in a personal model, I was thinking of cleaning my own consciousness, but cleaning it in bigger, uh, in bigger exercises. Uh, it's kind of like eating my karma in, f in fewer and larger bites. And it turns out that model was completely incorrect, uh, as I learned uh, by the second or third year. Mm -hmm. uh, did, did, did you have a sense when you're starting out that this would be a long-term endeavor that you'd be doing these journeys many, many times? No, I didn't. Uh, when I started it out, I had been meditating and I had encountered the usual blocks that everybody hits in the early years of meditation. And I first thought I would do some this therapy in order to push through and clear those blocks in order to accelerate my personal awakening. Um, and it turns out that that was a false model uh, to bring to it. And but once the adventure started, once I began to break into these experiences of the cosmos, uh, then uh, I was hooked. I, I did not expect it to be taking up such a large uh, proportion of my life. And what I found was if you go very deeply into this work, you're, you don't integrate it around the edges of your life and continue to live your life kind of like an ordinary life. Um, deep spiritual practice, as you know, all when you commit to very deep spiritual practice, it becomes your life. You wrap your life around your spiritual practice. And that happened for me too. I mean, it just, this became uh, a central focus of my life. Of course, I, my students and my teaching were a central focus. My children and family and marriage were a central focus. But my psychedelic work became the core of my deeper um, philosophical uh, undertaking. And how did those aspects of your life relate to each other and influence each other? Well, basically, uh, I, I feel that my marriage and my teaching uh, were very grounding. First, I, I love being a, a parent. I love being a dad. I love being married. I love teaching. I just love being in the classroom. Uh, and I found that those commitments just kept me grounded. Uh, when I was off exploring different dimensions of reality on the weekend, when I would come back, you know, there were dishes to wash and students to teach. It was a very grounding way. So they complemented each other well. It just, you know, because, I mean, any deep explorer, I think, has this experience. You're going in and out, you're going back and forth into these periods of deep absorption, like a, a retreat. And that's really why, I mean, I never say that I've tripped. I say I do a session. And it's kind of like a Zen session, a period set aside for intense spiritual practice. 
a psychedelic session is really a psychedelic session. It's a period set aside for intense spiritual practice. When you go back and forth over and over again, in and out of these states, back into your ordinary life, um, it's really, it's important to keep them in balance. And uh, my life was organized in such a way that it, it did keep those two different sides of my life, did stay in balance with each other and help each other. Mm -hmm. And can you speak to the, you make a distinction between using psychedelics for therapy and for spirituality and for, you know, the kinds of cosmological explorations that you ended up leaning towards. Can you speak to that distinction? Yeah. And that's something I became more articulate about as the journey uh, went on. And particularly as I came back and began to write up the entire thing. Uh, because I found that many people who were beginning to read my work were trying to understand it within uh, frameworks that were too small to understand the project. And so I differentiate very clearly now three different projects that you can do with psychedelics. You can do others, of course, but just three. One is therapeutic healing. This is the primary work of the psychedelic renaissance today, working on healing the wounds of the personal unconscious, post-traumatic stress, uh, death anxiety, depression, alcohol addiction. This is working at a personal level at the early stages. Uh, different than that uh, is spiritual awakening. This is basically to try to awaken spiritually to the truth of one's inner being, to experientially have access to the center of consciousness, which turns out to be the same unified reality as the entire field of consciousness that underlies all existence. This is a different project than simply therapeutic healing. It's, it, this is spiritual healing, spiritual awakening, you know, opening up to the, to the rich spiritual underlying fabric of existence. The exploring of the universe, cosmological exploration, is a different project still. Uh, cosmological exploration is not simply becoming aware or becoming tuned to the spiritual truths of life. It's exploring beyond those realities into the deep structure of existence, going beyond space, beyond time, going into deep time, uh, going into deep space, uh, going into archetypal reality, you do not have to go into these dimensions to wake up or become a fully realized human being. You do not have to go into archetypal reality. You do not have to go to the beginning of the universe before the Big Bang and watch creation emerge out of the great void of primal existence. This is a very kind of different agenda. And I, I think it's important to keep apples and, and oranges separate from each other. Now they reinforce each other, they support each other. In my journey, which became primarily one of cosmological exploration, of course there was a great deal of healing that took place at a personal level. And there were episodes of rich spiritual awakening. But if I were aimed at just spiritual awakening or just psychological healing, I would have organized the sessions quite differently. But spiritual, you know, cosmological exploration is really kind of like um, any kind of demanding extreme sport, kind of like going climbing Mount Everest or going to the North Pole. I don't know why anybody would want to go to the North Pole, but it's a very demanding thing that some people like to do. Exploring the deep structure of the, con of the cosmos is something like that. It's, it's a very demanding, rigorous, it requires tremendous safeguards. Uh, and it is going in places that very few people have gone. And it's not the same as spiritual awakening. Hmm. Yeah, I, I, on the one hand, I find the distinction persuasive because this really does characterize your work and the kinds of discoveries that you found. And then I, th I think if you were holding that distinction as like a purely separate thing, that wouldn't be aligned with my own experiences of these things. But um, it sounds like you're saying, that, no, they can all happen, but it's more like what you're aiming for or what your intentions are. Yeah, and they overlap. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. In that case, how 
did you structure your sessions so as to aim in the direction of cosmological exploration and how might someone structure them if they were aimed at the other goals? Well, <clears throat> I didn't, first, I didn't understand a lot of this at the time when I was doing this work. Mm -hmm. uh, I understood it only after I'd gone a long way down this road and was looking back and beginning to understand some of the choices, the, how the choices I'd made it impact the trajectory of the work. Uh, but basically, once you decide your dose, uh, that's a significant decision in this process. But working with high doses, you completely surrender to the process. You, I, it's impossible to try to direct. You can set all the good intentions you want, but the states of consciousness that arise with high doses of psychedelics amplified by very carefully selected music and internalization in a in a kiva practice this sets in motion processes that are so powerful you can't control them at all you can't direct them and you the strategy is simply to surrender to let the, to let your consciousness take you wherever it wants to take you to show you whatever it wants to show you no matter how inscrutable at the time, no matter how painful, no matter how absurd it may seem at the time, just let it take you. It's only after the fact, when you're putting it all together, that you may begin to understand some of the dynamics of the unfolding. So there's a, you put it together after each individual session, but then over a string of sessions, I found that there was a sequential development. So more or less one session where one session ended, the next session would begin. Kind of like keeping a dream journal, you're just going deeper and deeper. And you may not understand what's happening until multiple sessions down the road. And then when you look back, you understand that there's a continuity of development that is taking place across these different sessions. So it's not a matter of aiming the intention beyond the dose and setting. Um, it's really a matter of complete surrender and then figuring out after the fact what has happened. Hmm. What is the word Kiva that you used? Kiva, you know, in, uh, in the Native American uh, Southwestern tradition, when they would do sacred ceremonies with peyote or with uh, sacraments, there's a Kiva is a hole in the ground, you know, with uh, a ladder coming down and you sit deep in this hole in the ground around the fire, ladder is pulled up, you stay in there isolated all night long, doing ceremony until the next morning when it's over and the ladder is brought down. So it's, I use it as a metaphor of what a good psychedelic session is like. You're totally isolated from the world. You don't get up and move around. You don't talk a lot. You don't engage with the outside world. You're totally isolated that way you know that whatever you're confronting is coming from within yourself or coming through yourself. It's not, you're not being triggered by outside stimuli. Thank you for explaining it. Yeah. It's helpful. Um, yeah, there's a question on my mind about uh, your work and it, in particular, you know, it's almost as if you're presenting cosmological findings and I, I find them very persuasive personally and uh you know consistent with my own explorations and at the same time i there's a kind of question of um like w why would someone take these findings seriously as as some kind of you know not just like a an, an adventure that you had or an inner experience but as something that really says something about the nature of reality yeah yeah good question and of course the critical question how do we know this is more than just why isn't it just some kind of echoes of my personal unconscious or echoes off the collective unconscious and not something that really goes beyond uh, those canyon walls uh, and here we have to get down there are a couple of things first are are the experiences replicable do these experiences show up in the psychedelic sessions of other people if it were just me saying these things or describing these levels of reality, uh, then that, if it's just a one-off, then it may be just as you say, it could be you know, just a personal kind of indulgence. 
But these, the cosmology that emerges in psychedelic states, first of all, it's echoed in the work of other psychedelicists. If, they, if they're using a, a method and a substance that has sufficient power to break through the same number of layers, basically there is a convergence of experience that emerges at these very deep levels. So that when I'm describing my experiences, other psychedelic journeyers recognize them. They recognize them as reflecting their own experience as well. What's important in this context is to put all of our experiences on the table together, not just one person, but everybody's experiences. And by comparing all of our experiences in the context of the methodology that each of us use to realize these experiences, then we get a better understanding of, of what is idiosyncratic and what is common ground. In that context, my work, I think, is largely uh, comfortable within the common ground that Groff has outlined as he has integrated hundreds, thousands of, of psychedelic sessions from hundreds of people through time. But also what emerges in a psychedelic cosmology is not unique to psychedelics themselves, but the, it is the same cosmology that emerges in deep mystical traditions in deep spiritual traditions, the contemplative traditions. There are nuances of interpretation, of course, and there are, as different mystical traditions have different interpretive canvases to articulate their experiences. But if you do a phenomenological analysis, if you look at the lineages of, of witnessing that come out of world mystical cultures, and you compare them to what emerges in psychedelic cosmologies, they fundamentally are the same cosmology. So that in that sense, there's nothing unique in what I'm saying. The only thing that's unique is this particular method of gaining access to these dimensions of reality. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, I think the method is certainly unique. And, and there, I, at least for me, some of the findings that you share feel novel or things that I hadn't encountered previously. I mean, mm -hmm. in, in particular, the <clears throat> emphasis on uh, reincarnation as a kind of uh, process akin to evolution and uh, development in a certain way. I mean, <clears throat> there are similar things that I'd heard elsewhere, but but connecting it to evolution in particular feels feels novel. And then, um, you know, other things as well, but mm -hmm. that, that yeah. felt um, new. Um, yeah. So you said earlier that, um, you know, about two or three years into this process that you started to have a new understanding of the work that you're doing and it was less about your own personal you know blocks and unblocking yourself what was that uh discovery and, and what what did you learn as, as that transitioned well for the first two and a half years i was plunged into a level of consciousness uh, that's at the very bottom of the personal psyche it's a dimension that stan calls the perinatal level of consciousness it's at the interface of the limits of physical consciousness and the beginning of spiritual consciousness. So that typically people relive their own birth. They relive their, their fear of death. Birth and death are the revolving door of life. You know, we get here by being born. We leave time and space by dying. Um, in order for consciousness to expand beyond time space reality, one has to confront all that conditioning in our psyche, which tells us that we are a time-space self, that I am my egoic physical body-mind awareness. And none of us from that perspective are really sure what happens to us when we die. And many of us believe there's nothing that happens to us when we die. Death is the cessation of all existence. And we have all sorts of fears surrounding death. Uh, and anxiety surrounding death. And basically in the confrontation with these uh, perinatal dynamics, one engages all those fears that the universe is ultimately meaningless, that the universe completely destroys all of our uh, attempts to uh, do something of value, do something of enduring, that something in our life will endure. And one often re-experiences one birth in the same time. But eventually, if you keep at it, this process culminates in a, in a particular kind of existential crisis, often called ego death. And you're, you're 
physical identity is shattered. It's just absolutely shattered. And then you transition into a deeper level of spiritual reality that lies beyond the parameters of your physical consciousness. Now, this is very common in mystical traditions. Mystical traditions talk about the death of self, shunyata, emptiness of self, anatta, no self. Uh, it's very common in spiritual traditions as well as psychedelic traditions. It's what happened next that really kind of shifted my perspective. I was expecting after going through ego death that I would then have unfettered access into a spiritual reality. But what happened was the entire purification process began again at a different at a deeper level. I began to get drawn into exercises of vast uh, collective suffering, uh, tremendous pain and suffering, physical ordeals. It was like being swallowed by Dante's Inferno. Uh, and this went on session after session for two years, deeper and deeper into these vast landscapes of horrific pain uh, and brutality and suffering far beyond anything. I mean, my life has never touched anything like that. It's never known anything like that. Uh, and it, it, this was a, a real puzzle for me because for a long time I thought maybe this represented a deeper ego death. But in time I eventually came to the conclusion that no, this was not about healing or cleansing my personal psyche. That somehow in my sessions a shift had taken place and the focus had become the healing of the entire human species that somehow I was tapping into uh, festering fields of pain, which were being held within the collective unconscious of our entire species, that just as we individually hold on to our memories and experiences, and some of them are problematic, the entire human species holds on to the experiences of all of its children, all of humanity. And some of those experiences are very, very traumatic. The war, the experiences of war, the experiences of drought, the experiences of violence against each other. These aggregate within the collective psyche and they burden the collective psyche, just as our individual trauma burdens our personal psyche. And that somehow at this point in my sessions, I had been kind of given the opportunity and volunteered to cooperate with this process where the, by making these vast tracts of pain conscious, there was some way in which these were being lifted out of the collective psyche, just as when you encounter personal trauma in your personal psyche and you confront it, it lifts that trauma out of your personal system. And it was after going through this for two years that eventually there was a crescendo of this process, a huge healing process, which then threw me into a yet still deeper level of consciousness. And that's when I began to really understand that there are uh, cycles of death and rebirth in this work and that the cycles deepen and change as the level of consciousness that you are working on deepens. So the first level of healing and cleansing was taking place at the perinatal or personal level of consciousness. The second level of healing was taking place at the collective level of consciousness. And then there were levels of consciousness that I went to uh, that were even deeper. But this cycle of death and rebirth, purification and transformation, is a cycle that repeats itself multiple times if you keep going deeper into the great expanse. What words would you use to describe the levels that you went to beyond personal and collective? Uh, when I was looking back over the whole of my journey, uh, I basically divided it into five broad overlapping categories working at the level of the personal mind, working at the level of the collective mind, then moving into archetypal reality beyond, beyond even the collective psyche, 
and then uh, the level of causal reality or the one mind where the entire universe moves as one. And then beyond that, entering for the last five years of my work, uh, what I came to call the diamond luminosity, an exceptionally clear, hyper, hyper clear uh, expression of pure light, uh, which when I looked for religious correlations or spiritual traditions correlations, in Buddhism, I think this is what they call Dharmakaya, the clear light of absolute reality out of which existence springs. So those five levels, personal mind, collective mind, archetypal mind, the one mind, and diamond luminosity. Mm. I'd like to return to that. Um, maybe mm -hmm. one of the themes in your work is, uh, I think, giving a really persuasive case for reincarnation. And, uh, you know, I was already I already sort of believed in reincarnation for my own explorations, but uh, it's a really, really solid case that you make for it, I think. And um, you wrote a book, Life Cycles, about it. And then uh, mm -hmm. later on in your most recent book, LSD in the Mind of the Universe, you're like, oh, I there were some things that I, I think I didn't quite get to in that book. And I wonder if you could describe your, your current understanding sure. of reincarnation. Well, as a philosopher, I think reincarnation is a fundamental and important concept to examine uh, because philosophical traditions diverge if you believe that there is no reincarnation uh, and if you believe there is reincarnation, it, it, you, you end up with two different understandings of reality. So one of the early things I did in my academic career was really look seriously at the question, is there empirical evidence? What's the state of empirical evidence for reincarnation? Now, 50 years ago, this evidence, what did not exist, but today it does. I think we have ample empirical evidence that reincarnation is a simple fact of life. And the primary work here comes from Ian Stevenson's work studying young children around the world who have spontaneous detailed memories of their previous lifetime and the opportunity we have verified these memories and we have separated out and really re eliminated the possibility that they could have acquired these memories through natural means. So for that and for evidence from past life therapy, that is a strong philosophical case can be made for reincarnation being a simple fact of life. It doesn't mean we understand how it takes place. We don't understand the physics of it. We may even have a very incomplete understanding of the project of it, what the purpose of it is. Uh, and I personally think that the classic Eastern interpretation of reincarnation I've come to see is incomplete. It's a first approximation, but it's not the complete story. But because of this available evidence, the first book I wrote was on reincarnation, which presented the evidence and then asked, okay, so what? What, so what if reincarnation is a fact of life? What does this tell us about the way the universe works? The, the classic story and the story that I used in telling that story, the classic story of reincarnation is a story of the individual soul or individual consciousness making choices, inheriting the consequences of those choices, which out of which they then make new choices. So there is a learning cycle between choosing and inheriting, choosing and inheriting. And this takes place within a lifetime and it takes place across multiple lifetimes, but it's the story of the individual soul in becoming individually more spiritually mature, more capable, more compassionate, more talented, so on and so forth in there. It's an individual story. What I found in my psychedelic work when I began to open up into the collective psyche and deep within the collective fields of consciousness is that in addition to this individual story, there was a collective story that the entire human species in some fundamental ways operates as a single organism. There is an intelligence that's operating within the entire species and that all of our individual incarnations were profoundly and subtly integrated into the integration of this group species, of this group, and that there was a way in which 
the intelligence of the species was manifesting itself in certain patterns of detoxification, purification, and breakthrough that were happening collectively. So it wasn't just individual choices driving it all, but there were also collective choices and a collective intelligence driving the entire process. I also was given, a, came into a series of experiences that gave me a different understanding of where reincarnation is taking humanity. Because the classic Eastern vision is that reincarnation evolves you to a certain point until you have a, a core breakthrough. The Hindus called it moksha, escape, where we escape ego, but we also escape samsara, we escape physical existence. So uh, the basic vision here is you achieve moksha or you achieve nirvana, and then when you die, you achieve pari nirvana, final nirvana, but the goal is to achieve some type of spiritual fruition, which then allows you to graduate from space time and to rest in some spiritual paradise off planet, whether it's the, the Muslim garden or the Christian heaven or the Buddha pure land, it's some off planet paradise. But that of course leaves unanswered, what is the purpose of time and space? which was okay as long as we were thinking that time and space had only been around for a few thousand years. But now that we understand that we're talking billions and billions of years of evolution of time and space, it doesn't seem to really be a very satisfying account that to say that after all these millions of, uh, of years, billions of years and millions of years of evolution of Homo sapiens, it's, all the work that has gone into learning how to walk upright and and use and become a tool user and about 5000 years ago we became conscious of this deep common ground of the psyche that as soon as we begin to become conscious of this underlying encompassing uh, buddha nature our essential nature as soon as we become aware then we leave and the goal is just to leave and what happened in my sessions was something quite different at a pivotal session. And, and I'd done past life therapy before. I mean, not in the psychedelic work, but you know, hypnotherapy, I was familiar with a dozen or so, had worked with healing and integrating a dozen or so of my former lives. But in this session, my former lives started coming into me. They were coming into me and it was like wrapping filaments of white light around a, a kite spool more and more consciousness more and more lives were coming into me they had been healed they were coming into and they reached a point where they fused all of these individual lives fused into one life and when they fused i was there was an explosion of diamond light from my chest and i was catapulted into a state of awareness that was beyond anything i had known up to that point in time I was an individual, but I was an individual beyond any frame of reference that I had previously known. And this I came to understand as the birth of the diamond soul, I language it. Other people give it different words, but it basically the idea here is that reincarnation doesn't just grow us individually, layer by layer, class by class, you know, challenge by challenge, but there comes a time when our entire history is aggregated and integrates into a single consciousness. And at that point, that single consciousness becomes one's working identity. So basically what's happening is the soul is becoming born inside history. And by soul, I, I think there are ways of understanding the soul that are completely compatible with the Buddhist teaching on anatta and no self because this is not an egoic soul it's not a soul of boundaries it's not a soul of of that's inherently self-centered in its appetites but once the soul emerges there's a tremendous breath of intellect breath of compassion and a deep communion with the spiritual forces of the universe and so the goal of reincarnation it's not simply to evolve us to the point where we become spiritually awake and leave, but the goal is to evolve us to the point where truly we become 
a the next iteration of human evolution. We become a species of incarnate souls so that we're never tempted to take our private ego as our true identity, but we know ourselves to be uh, this time traveler. We know ourselves to be deeper than that. And we know we have kinship relations with so many thousands of people and we have kinship relationship with the earth. We know that the earth that we leave will be the earth we'll inherit in our next incarnation. Souls live on earth differently than egos do. And I think that's the, I, I think that's the pivot we're in the process of making now. And I understand four or 5,000 years ago in the axial age, when we first began to make discoveries of this spiritual reality, this spiritual reality, which is so much more satisfying than time space reality, it would develop an up and out cosmology, the, a theology which says the purpose is to go home. We don't believe belong here. This is our fallen condition. We don't want to stay here. We want to go back to where we came from. I understand that. But I think it's a, an incomplete understanding of the deeper project of creation. The project of creation is to awake and bring heaven to earth, to live the Buddha world here inside our physical existence. What, what do you feel? You know, so, so in my own life, I've been really moved by Buddhism and inspired by Buddhism and, and certainly other traditions as well. And uh, I find what you're saying compelling that, uh, you know, there, there was an incomplete truth to the teachings offered in the axial age where there's there's wisdom to them and and benefit and yet it's also incomplete and um i wonder how you would describe um the relationship of the perspectives that you hold now in to the teachings that we may have received from the past and and perhaps buddhism in particular well, <clears throat> once again, I want to emphasize that the work I did is a path of temporary immersion. Temporary immersion does not easily or conventionally lead to permanent shifts in awareness. You have to do a lot of spiritual practice before any of the things that we experience in the temporary condition, the psychedelic amplified condition, can become our ordinary daily consciousness. And so um, the great masters of the spiritual traditions and the great masters of the Buddhist tradition uh, have always been my heroes and their teachings have always been my guiding light in terms of how to engage the psychedelic states in a responsible manner, how to invest in them in a way which leads can be converted into or leads to long-term uh, transformations of one's baseline consciousness uh, on this earth. So first, truly, genuinely, all honor uh, to the great beings uh, of these traditions. Um, and at the same time, uh, we know that there is patriarchy, for example, uh, in the Buddhist traditions that Buddhism has had to clear itself of its patriarchy, just as other religious traditions have. I think there are other limitations. There is a, a kind of anti-physical, a disparagement of the physical body, which is a subtle disparagement of nature, which itself is becoming aware of and it is having to transcend. I think there are elements within Buddhism that have a deep appreciation of the joy of living the Buddha nature and sees that the Buddha nature uh, is intended to be lived within time and space, that samsara truly is nirvana, one understood completely. Nirvana does not require an abandonment of samsara, but actually is coherent with samsara. And yet, they're the mainstream sources of Buddhism for the popular people still have kind of an up and out cosmology working. Christianity too, you achieve salvation and then you escape to go to heaven. Um, so I think 
as an historian, it's simply a matter of, you know, understanding the historical context within which these great masters were working and which helped them and hindered them in some ways from the, you know, the full expression, giving full expression of their spiritual realization. And yet, in, even if you're working spiritually within an incomplete cosmology, the levels of spiritual realization which can be achieved is just extraordinary. What, what great masters can do, the great Mahasiddhas of the lineages can do, is just extraordinary and deserving of all respect. So in criticizing the cosmology within which some of them operate, that's not to criticize the level of spiritual realization that they have achieved. You know? Nor, to, I want to emphasize again, to have had unusually deep ex spiritual experiences in a psychedelic state is not to have stabilized those experiences in any meaningful way in one's ordinary uh, consciousness. There is still a great deal of work to do before those states of awareness can become abiding in any uh, serious sense. So I, I always want to qualify uh, the insights that emerge uh, in psychedelic work. Yes, yes. Um, and certainly for myself, this is a question that comes from a place of deep respect. I mean, uh, Buddhism is is like like my home in a certain way. So, uh, mm -hmm. uh, but I appreciate the the clarifications that you add to it. And uh, um, I wonder, <clears throat> you know, you spoke earlier about your own spiritual practice and the different traditions that you've been exposed to. And it seems like you found sort of a home in, in Vajrayana Buddhism. Is that is that right? It is. And it's a kind of a modified mm -hmm. uh, Vajrayana because mm -hmm. I was doing kind of intense Vajrayana practice for a number of years. And I've modified it from my own uh, psychedelic experiences uh, because I've come to understand that uh, I have, it's not that I've realized the states that I encountered in my deep psychedelic work, but I have an understanding and experience of those levels of reality. They live inside me as memories. They are active memories. And so I've developed forms of Vajrayana practice. Uh, I've expanded them by actively integrating those memories into uh, the realization protocols. So, for example, you know, in, in classic Vajrayana practice, we distinguish between the Samaya Sattva and the Janana Sattva. The Samaya Sattva is the being of construct. It's the being we formulate through our mantras, through our visualizations and using of tankas and exercises to create some approximation of pure goodness, pure insight, which then attracts the Janana Sattva, the reality, the cosmic reality. So we we make our visualization pure in order to open a channel between the cosmic reality, which then we invite to pour its blessings into us. Well, in a way, I use my psychedelic memories as part of constructing my Samaya Sattva. To me, the living memory of the diamond luminosity is a more effective spiritual vehicle of practice than the beautiful tankas that attempt to give some type of physical expression of this sublime perfection. Okay, mm -hmm. so I modify it in that way. I also have a sense um, because I've died so many times and because I've gone where I will go when I die physically, I've gone into that domain so many times I feel a deep comfortableness with it, uh, and I feel a familiarity with that domain. And um, I think this changes one's practice because, you know, we're told over and over again, we practice in order to prepare for the moment of death, because the moment of death is the great potential, has great potential for accelerating our evolution. 
and I agree with that. And I, I tried to live that in my psychedelic practice has been done in a way to prepare me for the moment of death. And the net result of it is that I feel very comfortable with death and I feel very comfortable with uh, being able to navigate what comes after death because I feel like I've already encountered it in many ways. What do you think it was about Adriana Buddhism that uh, attracted you and felt like you could uh, you know, metaphorically find a, find a home there? Well, it was my first wife, Carol, who was my sitter in my sessions, a clinical psychologist herself, who really brought me into Vajrayana. I was kind of aesthetics. I was more interested in the Zen tradition. Uh, I really wasn't interested with all the bells and candles and incense and you know all the fanfare that comes with Vajrayana. Uh, but she went there and I basically followed her there and through her met the teachers uh, that were gathering and came through Tara Mandala, a uh, Buddhist retreat center, uh, Lama Sultra Malayoni established a center in Colorado and began to study with her and to go into retreats with the teachers of that lineage. And so I, I met their lineage of awakened beings and they made a deep impression on me. If my karma had been such as to introduce me to the great awakened beings of the Zen lineage, then, you know, I could have gone there uh, just as easily. But it was just the opportunity to meet these beings, to receive teachings from them uh, that made a, a, a large impression on me. And uh, coming back to your explorations, uh, you use the phrase deep time. Can you say what you mean by that? Yeah. When I uh, first began to enter the ocean of suffering, when I made the transition outside of egoic after ego death, and I went into these episodes of uh, collective anguish, when I came, in, every session is divided into sort of two halves. There's a purification half followed by an ecstatic half. So you go through the purification half and if you submit to it, it comes to a crescendo a breakthrough, and then you're spun into a transpersonal of section of teachings and ecstatic in teachings and next and so on and so forth. When I was being when I was thrown after this very intense collective purification, I began to enter into states of consciousness that were extremely novel and unprecedented for me. And I came, I first called it whole time, and I came to call it deep time. I began to have experiences of my entire life start to finish as a completed whole. It was like every time moment in my life was in a tree, was a tree, and I experienced the whole of my life as a single tree. I experienced my old age, my middle age, I experienced the themes of my life as simultaneously present. This was such a, a dramatic expansion of my cognitive frame of reference that after the session, I couldn't hold on to it. It disappeared. I forgot it. I couldn't hold it. Um, but I found that with repetition, going back into that state again and again, and it was I was always taken into the same reality for a year, uh, for seven sessions, by returning to it and working very diligently to stabilize your state of consciousness there, I learned how to, to hold on to it. I learned to remember it. I learned how to become cognitively competent in deep time. And what I've came to believe was that there, there are really many multiple modalities of time operating within the universe. Later, after this period, when I went still deeper in my work, going in toward archetypal reality, I experienced larger swaths of time than just my personal life. The first was my personal life, about maybe 100 years. But then I began to experience whole time or deep time in terms of 
hundred thousand year increments and maybe even larger later. And basically, not only was my sense of time expanding, but who the being was who was having those experiences was expanding. So it's not simply like you take a, a disembodied ego and have an experience of transpersonal reality, which you then bring back, but literally your ego is shattered and you dissolve into a deeper level of consciousness. And it is that deeper level of consciousness that opens up into these deeper levels of time. And then in still deeper, you, you literally become a different being than simply a discarnate egoic presence. You, you become a different being for hours and hours at a time. So you're dissolved into the fabric of existence and dissolved into the fabric of existence. You sometimes have experiences of how existence itself experiences time. Now, there are some trends in physics today uh, that are hypothesizing that just as super string theory hypothesizes multiple dimensions of existence beyond time and space, that some of these dimensions of existence that physics is conceptualizing involve different modalities of time. I don't know what the relationship is exactly between that and what my experiences is, but my experience is that as you go to the edges of space time, you enter into different modalities of time and different sets of insights emerge in these different modalities of time. Now, I understand how absurd this sounds to my academic colleagues and my scientific colleagues who generally tend to think that the entire universe works within linear time. There is an arrow of time. Tachyons may move backwards in time, but basically the universe moves forward in time and it's an absolute limit. Uh, I think the very best of the edge of quantum thinking goes beyond that. And certainly my psychological, my psycho spiritual experiences go beyond that. Time became very porous in my work, as did all my boundaries in the work. Hmm. I imagine it's difficult to put into words, but is there anything more that you can say about what the experience of that is like, like either with your own personal life, seeing the whole of it at once or uh, the larger scales? Well, first, once you acclimate to it, it's not confusing at all. It's clear, very, very clear. It's, it's simply a different way of relating to time. Uh, insights emerge out of the fabric out of an extended fabric of time. For example, at the personal level, when I experienced my, my life as a completed whole, naturally, I understood the deep structure of my life better than I had before. I understood some of the themes of my life. I understood how things that I had been concerned with and the recurring issues of my philosophical inquiry and my personal life, that those issues were deeply etched in life and would be consuming me for the entirety of my life. I could, I could see and feel my future. You don't, I didn't see all the details. It's not like seeing all the details of your life, but it is as though all your time moments congeal to give you a deep reading of what the substance of your life is about. Likewise, when you dissolve into the human species, and you dissolve into a large swath of time on the order of hundreds of thousands of years, you have, there are insights that arise in that context about the developmental stages of human evolution. So I began to have experiences of not just of my personal future, but of humanity's future. And I know, again, I know this sounds arrogant and like ego run amok, but it's the most natural thing in the world that when you dissolve into the condition of the full species mind and you dissolve into deep time simultaneously, it's just natural that some of the developmental future what is from our present, the future of this species comes into view. 
But when you experience that, you don't experience it as something yet to be. You experience it as something that already has been. And both of those are held simultaneously. It is yet to be, and it's also something that has been. So it has a certainty about it. And I don't know how to to work out or reconcile all of these things with free will and any number of different questions. But there is just a there's a breadth of understanding that opens so that not only did I begin to understand better what my personal life was about, but I began to understand the time in history that humanity has entered, that it's coming into a developmental crisis, it's coming into an evolutionary pivot point. And, and some of the characteristics of that crisis and the characteristics of a breakthrough, which I think is coming. These all emerge or these all become possible uh, by shedding the, the limitations of linear time as we conventionally know it and going into deeper dimension of time. Uh, I was definitely thinking about free will just now and I it makes sense that it would be difficult to address that on a large scale philosophically I mean it's a, a, a long long debate uh, but mm -hmm. I wonder what sensibilities these experiences gave you about your own life and free will and choices and you know sort of having a sense of your whole life did did you feel sort of like you were fated to make certain choices or that you had uh, free will in it or how, how did that impact you yeah. personally? Yeah. Free will is a tricky topic, isn't it? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and much of our popular discussion of it, I find just not very satisfying, just skims the surface. Um, advocates of free will over tend to understate the level of conditioning that qualifies our freedom um, and people who believe that uh, the determinism of our conditioning is so profound that we may feel like we're free, but if you examine it really carefully, you find out that your conditions are so highly conditioned, your choices are so highly conditioned that there really isn't free will there. I find a lot of that discussion just not very satisfying on either front. Um, to me, one of the themes that has come through repeatedly in my work is that uh, we, do, we do have free will. It's a conditioned free will, but we have within those conditions the opportunity to make choices. If we didn't have the opportunity to make choices, we wouldn't be truly learning. There really wouldn't be an adventure of learning. If when we incarnate, we were simply just inheriting a predetermined fate, then we're just basically going through the process of mechanical actualization, and it wouldn't be a genuine learning exercise. If you can't make mistakes, if you can't truly come to crosswords and roads and say, well, I'm going to go either A or, or B, which one should I do? And that's a true choice, a genuine choice, which has learning ramifications then we wouldn't be, it, it wouldn't be an adventure in learning. And I don't think, uh, I think the universe wants us to learn. It, it, at least the messages that I get is that uh, freedom is an absolutely important quality. Now, it's always relative. At, at early stages, there's very little freedom. When grass grows, it doesn't have a lot of freedom in terms of how to respond to photosynthesis and so on and so forth. But the more our consciousness develops, the more choice enters into the picture, the more individuated consciousness becomes, the more the cycle of learning becomes more important. And still our, our choice is conditioned, but the conditioning gets lighter and lighter. The sense of freedom, being able to make clear choices um, emerges. But to make free choices, to make clear choices requires certain uh, a self-conscious practice of stepping out of the conditioning of our mind. And of course, uh, the meditation traditions are well aware of this because when we quiet the mind, what we become 
very aware of is all the multiple voices that are going on inside us and all the layers of conditioning that are conditioning our moment to moment awareness. And we have to patiently strip those away. We have to let them exhaust themselves. And as we do, that clarity of unconditioned consciousness begins to dawn within our awareness, right? And that becomes, uh, that is such a novel experience and so distinct from conditioned consciousness that it becomes a very highly desirable state to cultivate, to enter our true nature, our unconditioned nature. I think these insights replicate themselves in psychedelic work as well that uh, what one encounters that in psychedelic work is conditioning. You're throwing off layer and layer and layer and layer of conditioning, purifying, purifying. It's like all one long nundro, all one long practice of purification. To uncover what is already there, but something which has been covered over by that conditioning. Now, in cosmological exploration, you are going beyond what is simply uncovering what is already there. But that still remains part of the one of the core dynamics is letting go of the conditioning to have a deeper experience of the clarity that's present in the immediate conditions of one's awakened mind. Okay. Hmm. Can you say more about the sort of uh visions that you had for humanity's future and the time that we're in. Mm. This was one of the great surprises for me in there because I never expected anything like this to emerge in my work. I thought this was about personal transformation or even personal enlightenment or something like that. I never imagined that the evolution of the species would become such a dominant theme in my work. What happened was going all the way back to about halfway through the work back into the early, early 90s, starting in 1991, I began to have a, a series of visions, they were just dropped into my sessions, a series of visions that humanity was coming to a turning point. This was a true before and after point in history. This was a uh, uh, we were entering a time of intense purification, that we were basically purifying the human psyche of the sins of our fathers, so to speak, purifying ourselves, lifting the conditioning of the past in order to make us more receptive to and capable of internalizing a spiritual infusion, spiritual insights and power that was coming into us, becoming made available to us at this time in history. So there was a tremendous sense of rebirth coming. And all of this was contextualized within an initial experience of experiencing creation in terms of love, that, that the act of creation, the Big Bang, is not simply a generative act of power or an act of uh, intelligence but it actually is an act of love, that creation is itself an act of love, of cosmic love, and therefore that all the suffering which, has, which takes place, has taken place since the Big Bang, all the suffering in, in the human story in particular, all that suffering takes place in the context of love. This is not something which is being done to us, it's not something which we are guilty, we are in any way guilty about. This is all part of a creative process that we entered into voluntarily. We entered into by choice. And it is hard, it's very difficult, but it is a, a noble gift that we are giving to the creative process to participate in the evolution of this species at such an early and barbaric time in its life that we do these terrible things to each other. But all of this was coming to a crescendo, a moment in history where we would pivot into a higher order, a higher order of spiritual awareness, a higher order of psycho spiritual realization. So this went on for years and eventually 
uh, I catalog these in the book in a section that I call the visions of awakening, six core visions, and that the creative intelligence was trying not just to awaken individuals, but it was trying to awaken the entire species. But it gave me no insight into how it was going to pull this off. I had no idea how it could possibly achieve this type of breakthrough um, in human evolution. And then in 1995, uh, right before Christmas in 1995, I had a session in which I was taken deep into deep time. I was dissolved into the species. So there was no more crispation. I just dissolved completely into the species and taken into deep time and experienced the death and rebirth of humanity in a transtemporal context. So I experienced a time in history of increasing destabilization, of, tum of uh, chaos and tumultuous unraveling. The systems of life were being unraveled. There seemed to be wave after wave of ecological crises that eventually triggered a global systems crisis, a period of breakdown of structures at deeper and deeper levels, an unraveling of life. We were losing control uh, of life. We were, it wasn't, we couldn't kind of fix our way out of this. This was a profound shattering of life as we had known it at the core. And in the midst of this, at the point where it looked like we were all going to die, it was as if a storm passed over the island, like a hurricane passing over a Pacific island. And the winds began to subside, the metaphorical winds began to subside. And the worst of the crisis passed, and we began to pick ourselves up off our knees. And as we picked ourselves up off our knees and began to rebuild and reconnect and put together life on the other side of this crisis, we were we found that we were different beings we were not the same as we had been when we went into this crisis there's something that happens in this multi-generational crisis and i don't have beyond what i've said i don't have any details of when where or how it, it wasn't that kind of experience it was the fact that humanity was coming into a profound crisis at a global level a global systems crisis, uh, that something about this transformation would break through the deep layers of conditioning of the human heart, would tear away all the self-centered behaviors, not only of individuals, but of our culture, would just break us down. And when we moved through this crisis, we discovered values inside our being. We discovered new values, new insights, new ways of being in the world, new ways of being with each other. This wasn't simply the birth of, a, of an ecologically responsible civilization. It wasn't simply the, a cultural rebirth, but it literally represented a shift in the core structure of the human psyche. This was a shift in the plate tectonics of the collective psyche. That Anyway, that was the vision of it. And, and I think that the if in my experiences, I examine what the nature of this future human is, what is this future human that's so much more than the present human is, what is it? And I think it is the emergence of the diamond soul in history. I think that we have been growing the diamond soul, gestating the diamond soul for incarnation after incarnation for tens of thousands of years, hundreds of thousands of years. But the birth of the diamond soul in history is a relatively short traumatic convulsive period. Gestation is long, birth is short. I think we are entering a time in history where we can no longer afford the luxury of a planet run by egos, even well-intentioned egos. We have to grow up. We have to grow into a deeper, our deeper spiritual identity. And that deeper spiritual identity is the diamond soul or the soul or however you want to language this. We need to grow up and 
I think that we have entered this crisis, this beginning, the very, very early stages of an unraveling of life as we have known it, and we are going into a future. And I think it's really important to have a vision. That's why at the end of the book, I really focus on the visions that I was given of the future human. Because if we don't have an understanding of what's going on, if we don't have a vision of what nature is in the process of producing, then the pain will be so intense, we could succumb to despair and some terrible apocalyptic interpretation that would be very counter our survival. And I think we need to have a, a deep understanding of where nature is taking us. How does this phrase that used diamond soul relate to the diamond luminosity that you began to experience in your own sessions? Is it the same thing or something different? I think it's a variation of the same thing. Uh, the diamond luminosity I experienced, I believe to be uh, a level of reality in the cosmos. I mean, in Buddhist terminology, I would describe it as an extra samsaric reality, which means it's beyond cyclic existence, which means it's beyond the bardo. There are many, many, many layers of the bardo. There's the low animal hell realms, there's the high deity realms, but the diamond luminosity is beyond all of those. And there is a clear sensation, a phenomenological difference between experiencing the high deity realms and then moving into the diamond luminosity realms, which is beyond all deities, beyond archetypes, beyond any of this dimension. Now, when the soul congealed in my being and the diamond luminosity, the, it, the soul exploded from my chest, it had that same quality of light as the diamond luminosity, but a, a slightly lower intensity of that light. Uh, now, let me back up. We experience light many times in the psychedelic journey. It's very common when you go through ego death, you enter light. You encounter, when you enter collective dimensions, you experience dimensions of light. I had known light many times. The diamond luminosity is not simply using a fancy metaphor to describe this light. I learned that there are many degrees of light, there are many dimensions of light, and the diamond luminosity is an exceptionally pure, exceptionally clear dimension of light. I think the diamond soul as, an, as a light being is a manifestation of this quality of light inside individuated existence. So it's on the one hand, it's the same, and on the other hand, it's a variation on the same. I wouldn't want to say it's necessarily identical, but it seems to be very, very close. I will say that when I entered the Diamond Luminosity work over five years, basically I only entered what I call the Diamond Luminosity four times. And I entered it about once a year uh, for four years. So I would do a very intense purification for session after session. I would tap into the diamond luminosity. Then I would be brought back for another year, of very, very intense purification before being brought back into the diamond luminosity again. So it, it wasn't like accessing it easily and ever once I gained accents. I only touched that reality four times in its total purity. From the way you're describing it, I'm getting a sense of almost like, uh, you know, the scientific name for humanity currently is like homo sapiens and almost like a, a different kind of humanity. Like, I, I don't know the Latin term for diamond, but like diamond human or something like that. Is is that consistent with what you're saying? It is. People give it different names. Some people call it homo noeticus, a knowing humanity, homo spiritualis. Some people call it homo luminans a light humanity. I think many of us have this intuition that humanity is going into a next iteration. You know, there was a time about 100,000 years ago where the size of our brain basically increased 50%. I mean, in a very short period of time, suddenly we were dealing with a much larger brain. 
nature triggered, it decided to give us a bigger brain that we came in with larger equipment. Something like that is happening now. We are cooperating with an evolutionary process, but we are, we are not driving the process. Nature is driving this process. Nature is bringing us into this new condition. And we have, many people have this intuition, many indigenous cultures have this intuition of this time of global crisis followed by breakthrough. And there's no absolute certainty you know, that we will survive birth. Dur birth is the dangerous time. Not all fetuses survive the birth process. So it's not like this is a foregone conclusion, but so many beings have had this intuition and they, they bring different names for describing this future human. Mm. 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 There's a term that you borrow from Groff of uh, coex systems, and then you mm -hmm. describe uh, meta coex systems and um, I think a lot of what you're talking about seems related to that. I wonder if you could verbally describe what those are and, and, and explain yeah. those a little bit. What Stan found is that the, the psyche organizes its experiences. It organizes its memories in terms of clusters, thematically integrated clusters, so that it, if it takes all of our experiences of abandonment and all of those experiences that we've had around abandonment form one tight experiential cluster, which he calls a coex system or a system of condensed experience. Carl Jung called it a complex. We could have experiences around anger, experiences around fear, experiences around uh, unrequited love. That they basically, it's kind of like reading a novel taking all the emotions that take place in the novel, highlighting with different colors, cutting up the novel and taking all the green in one ball and all the yellow in another ball and all the red in another ball, that when we encounter a problem in the psyche, we don't simply encounter one form of that problem. We encounter a cluster of experiences that date back sometimes all the way into our birth experience and sometimes including former lives but we when we melt this problem we melt it in layers we first we melt the outside layers the less problematic until we eventually get to the very very core what was the seed problem which may date from this lifetime may date from birth may date from a former lifetime and we dissolve this cluster this coex system now, my experience has been that the same is true for the collective psyche, that the mind of the universe and the mind of our species stores its history in these massive thematic clusters. So all the trauma associated with war, all the trauma of drought and, and dying in the plains, all the trauma of male female violence, all these patterns of, of violence and, and pain and suffering, fear of death, that these don't exist as free-floating private existences, private memories within the bardo of our individual souls. But this, the collective psyche aggregates its history into these massive collective structures that I call metacoic systems. So you have coic systems within the personal psyche and meta coex systems within the collective psyche. I think when I was moved into the ocean of suffering, what was happening was my system was engaging meta coex systems within the collective psyche and making some small contribution to removing those clusters from the collective psyche. You know, not all of them, certainly not any of one all the way down. This is a work of generations uh, and all spiritual traditions. Uh, the saints and sages and the contemplatives have the same experience. They all tap into levels of suffering, which are not personal, which go deeper. And that's why um, uh, bodhicitta uh, manifesting the will to save all sentient beings is the only appropriate motivation for doing spiritual practice because you quickly realize that this is a game that's not 
a personal game. It's not a private game. We're in this together. It's a, it's a collective evolutionary process. So for me, that engages uh, meta-coex systems. What, what is the species aiming at, as you understand it? Oh, I think we are, we are, I don't know that we can really identify aiming at, but we are constantly growing. We are, if anything, we are aiming at growing. Uh, because if we think that, if we identify what we're growing to, what we're really doing is only identifying the next stage of our evolutionary growing. But if we just look around, it's taken us 13.7 billion years to get to here. And assuming we survive this crisis, we're going to be at it for millions and billions of years more. So whatever this crisis is that humanity is coming into and growing beyond to grow beyond ego, to grow beyond the narrow confines of our self-centered, self-clinging, to go into a larger uh, sense of our being and presence in the universe and communion with the universe, this is just the next phase. And we will have more thresholds and more challenges that will take us into yet another phase. So if I step back from all of that and I say, what is happening here? What is the project? I think the project is to grow and become more than we were before. Mm -hmm. It's a process description. It's not a, it's not a content description. It's a process description, just to grow and become more than we were to be more capable. Now, I think another aspect of this, just on the short term, all the spiritual teachings teach us that the essence of the individual is the same as the essence of the totality. Atman is Brahman. We are made of the stuff of the divine, if we speak of it in divine languages. Or our, our Buddha nature, our awakened nature, is the same as the Buddha nature of all living things, of all things. So, uh, when one awakens to one's essential nature, you're awakening to the love and the compassion and the power that created the universe, that manifests the universe. And there, there are many stages to this process, but first there is the joy of awakening to that. But then there is the process of learning how to actualize that so that one's life becomes uh, a conscious manifestation of the power of our essential nature manifesting in the physical world. And I don't, I really don't want to reduce this to such simplistic philosophies like you become like what you love and, and as you think is what becomes your destiny, but something basically that recognizes that the experience, what the experiences that come at us in the outer world are in some core way of reflection of what is coming out of us at a deep psycho spiritual level. And that once you understand that there is this feedback process between what we are putting out and what is coming back to us, and you take responsibility for that process, then you begin to consciously manifest your chosen destiny, rather than inherit a destiny which has been created by your unconscious process. So that we are becoming at this stage, I think, conscious creators of our own destiny. We wake up and we become, we're basically learning how to become creators because our nature is the creative principle. Our nature is the same as the nature which manifested the entire physical universe. So what we're learning how to do is first discover and then actualize and then participate consciously in creation inside time and space. Okay. What we do with that, where we take that as a species, you know, just imagine what we can do, mm. uh, a species operating out of that kind of consciousness. Yeah, I'm, I'm getting the sense, you know, coming back to the question I asked earlier about like, what is maybe incomplete about Buddhism or other earlier teachings and, you know, there the sensibility that I at least received was like, uh, you know, existence is 
a cycle of birth and death that is uh, in some ways sort of like hellish and you should just escape. And that's the goal is to escape and get out. And um, from what I'm hearing from you, it's almost as if both on individual and collective levels, the aim isn't to escape, but to learn and grow and evolve and uh, have incomplete, increased complexity and, and nuance and understanding of oneself and the universe and really to to manifest that um, rather than just like getting out or eradicating this or something like that. Yes, I think so. And in the end, once we make this transition, we understand that what we have escaped is not time and space, but we've escaped a certain mental consciousness associated, a, a constricted consciousness that's associated with our living inside time and space. But when that bubble pops, when we have truly escaped that small world, we experience time and space completely differently. Mm. We experience time and space as the Buddha world, as the Buddha nature. Mm. If you don't mind me asking, what is your everyday consciousness like now after all of these experiences mm. and uh, explorations? Yeah. Well, I wish I could tell you that I'm a fully enlightened being and I just cruise in the cosmic planes all the time, but that's not the case. Uh, integrating in my, uh, integrating these experiences is a lifelong undertaking. Uh, in fact, and the more I'm thinking about it in the 20 years after I stopped this work, uh, the more I appreciate just how large the integration process is, even to the point that I really, I don't really think we know how entering these deep levels of reality is, is influencing us as human beings. I, I think we're just scratching the surface. If we're working in therapeutic work, and if we're bringing out issues from the personal unconscious, then we have a model for how to integrate those experiences. If we go deeper and have spiritual experiences of the intelligence that runs through all of life, we have spiritual models for how we might integrate those experiences. But when we go really, really deep, when we go beyond space and time, when we enter deep, dissolve into the luminous body of creation, how are those experiences being integrated in us then? In the end, I don't think you can integrate the infinite into the finite. The only thing you can do is integrate your finite existence into infinity. And that brings us back to the nuts and bolts of spiritual practice. You must remove from your being everything which keeps you smaller than the reality that you are seeking to uh, enter into. And that's a, that's a lifelong undertaking uh, I used to think that maybe by the end of my lifetime, maybe I would have succeeded in integrating all of these experiences. Now I think that that's too optimistic. I think this work changed not only my present lifetime, but it changed the trajectory of my entire soul's evolution. I also want to say that I've kind of come to the conclusion that uh, I pushed myself harder and farther on this work than was really probably wise for me. I think that it is possible to go too deep in one lifetime. And, and it's not that the, the suffering is problematic. It's not that the pain that's inherent and in purifying at those very, very deep levels is problematic. It's the joy, it's the ecstasy uh it's being dissolved the ecstasy of being dissolved into unspeakable beauty and intelligence which can make your physical existence kind of feel dried up like not worth living and i think i have suffered from that after stopping my work i've really had to make conscious choices and lifestyle choices how to manage the memories that now live within me in a way that I don't think it's necessarily, uh, it's not something I don't recommend to people. It's a very demanding process. Uh, and I don't think I needed to do it this way. 
if I were starting it over again, I would be gentler. I would have uh, gentler ambitions and a gentler, I'd take more care of this precious body mind. Hmm. What would that look like practically to be gentler? I think it would mean uh, fewer high dose sessions. It would mean if you're working with psychedelics, uh, it would mean integrating, um, working with the substance like LSD, which tends to push the high cosmological ceiling with substances like psilocybin or ayahuasca, which tend to be more body grounded, kind of staying closer to the emotional textured body. Um, of course, it always means uh, integrating your intermittent psychedelic work with daily spiritual practice. The more I've moved in this direction, the more I've come to understand that a daily spiritual practice is absolutely essential in order to handle the enormous swings of energy and insight that open to you in your psychedelic work. But I would just be, I would be gentler. I mean, one of the reasons I pushed as hard as I did is because I had adopted what I learned to be as a false model. I had adopted a vision that said the purpose of this work was to reach a particular state, you know, to reach the condition of awakened state or to reach um, to reach home, to go home, to reach heaven, to reach, to dissolve into the, into the body of God, to dissolve into the metacosmic void. And what I found was that there are many degrees of oneness and there are many degrees even of the void. And no matter how deep I went, I discovered that there were dimensions beyond even those dimensions. And the key came for me in the 50th session when I was in the diamond luminosity. I was as deep in the diamond luminosity as I would ever go. And right in the middle of that existence, my field opened up and I saw reality far, far into the distance that was filled with a light that was even a greater form of light than the diamond luminosity. And a beam of light came and hit me and absolutely shattered my mind. And that's when I realized it's an infinite progression. You never, the idea of getting to the end of it is just a false idea. It underestimates the breadth of what we're dealing with. So once I, I understood that it's not about getting to a particular condition or a particular state, that made me more patience or makes me more patience with, you open up, you bring as much of that reality into your life as you can and then you you crunch it you sit on it you you integrate it into your daily life and so i'd be gentler and have more modest expectations i'm more patient with our human psycho spiritual evolution than i was when i was a young man hmm. what would you recommend to someone embarking on a similar journey if they were inspired by your work don't do it please <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, I mean, don't do it the way I did it. I'm not, and you know, I get lots of letters from people who have said, I've never done psychedelics, but I know what you're speaking about. I've been doing a meditation for empty empty years and I've had these kinds of experiences. And so we know that psychedelics are not unique to these experiences at all. But uh, my recommendation is to go slow, always work within a therapeutic modality pay a lot of attention to your set and setting, not only on the day of your sessions, but when you do this work, everyone around you is impacted. Your family members, your friends. I found that my students were being drawn into my psychedelic practice and that I wrote The Living Classroom basically to describe, the, quite to my surprise, how what I had thought of as a purely private spiritual practice was actually registering and impacting the lives of my students who were taking my courses in this time. Uh, and that this is a natural, a natural event, that consciousness is like water in a lake. You throw in a, a rock and the ripples naturally spread out, that this is true spiritual practice as well. Uh, it's just natural that people would be touched by those experiences. <clears throat> so I would be gentler, uh, Again, I don't know why somebody would want to go to the North Pole, but it's not a recreational undertaking. It's a serious lifelong commitment. And 
I think it's much wiser simply to explore closer to home uh, in, in ways that keeps the journey more focused uh, on the nuts and bolts of one's daily life. So I have more respect for using psychedelics as therapy and as spiritual awakening. And it's a relatively rare individual who has the circumstances and the constitution to go this as deep as I did into it. And I want to, there are dangers, right? If you open up under less than ideal circumstances, if you open up in circumstances in which you are mixing it up with other people or at dance raves, you can open up prematurely you and you can failure you can have failure to close you can hurt yourself you can really hurt yourself in ways that does long-term damage and may take you years to recover so i i i want to emphasize that this is not an end run around traditional spirituality it's not a and it's not an easy path it's a tricky path and it is a potentially dangerous path and you have to be very cautious when you are working with mind amplifiers. Hmm. I imagine the kind of person drawn to doing the work that you did wouldn't take your advice to not do it. Uh, they might take your advice to be gentler, but I imagine they'd be sort of bullish about it and be like, I'm gonna do it anyway. Uh, well, you know, one of the things I hope is that <clears throat> by seeing what I learned, by seeing the description of the universe that I was able to bring back and share with other people, I hope that that would answer or satisfy a certain existential longing to know these things so that they don't have to go there, mm -hmm. you know, that they that they can be more comfortable living within uh, a more textured or more inwardly closer to earth textured form of spiritual practice that they don't, you don't, you know, when people went to the moon, it satisfied so many of us who have had that longing, but who will never make the trip mm. just to see their pictures and see what it was like. Mm. And I think it's something can be like that with spiritual practice too. Mm. Yeah. Oh, that's a good metaphor for it. I, I think that certainly describes my own experience reading your book. And uh, I'm grateful for sort of the, oh, I don't remember what they call it, but the picture of the earth that they took from the moon. It's, it's as if you took that kind of a picture for us. And it's a really beautiful yeah. one. Um, yeah. Earthrise, I think maybe it's called. Uh, Earthrise, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm curious, what what do you make of, you know, at this time there's sort of a larger uh, contemporary renaissance, you might say, in, in psychedelics. What do you make of that movement and what's happening there more mm. broadly? Uh, that's, I think it's very exciting. I think it's about time. I'm very glad that we're going back in the direction of integrating psychedelics into our culture. Right now, the psychedelic renaissance is focused on therapeutic healing. It's by demonstrating the clinical effectiveness of these amplifying substances that we are opening the door to these substances in our culture by demonstrating that they help us deal with post-traumatic stress, depression, or alcohol addiction, or death anxiety. By healing us of the wounds of life, we are demonstrating that these substances have therapeutic value and therapeutic efficacy. And we're also taking pictures of how the brains behave on psychedelics. And we're doing this very carefully controlled studies where we have control groups versus a testing group and so on and so forth. This is all really important. I think it's, it's a very important stage, but I do see it as only a stage. Uh, <clears throat> What we're going to find is the same thing we found in the early decades of the psychedelic movement, uh, that these, this amplification of the, of the psyche, which allows us to heal the wounds of the personal psyche, that same amplification when continued gets us, gives us access to deeper and deeper dimensions of consciousness. Now, there is a resistance to these deeper dimensions right now because of our metaphysical commitment to materialism, right? Our course, you know, pre-quantum commitment is to believe that 
only things which are physical are real. And therefore, when someone is having an experience of something which goes beyond physical reality, we call the substances that open up these experiences hallucinogens, because the hallucination is something which is not real, right? It feels real, but it's not real. But I think what better understood, these substances are mind amplifiers. They are psychedelics, mind openers. And this once we consolidate and provide sufficient evidence for the healing potential of these substances, we will then begin to harness the deeper manifesting potential of these substances or their philosophical potential. I think psychedelics represent an enormous philosophical revolution because they allow those of us who are kind of have modest capacities to have temporary access to whose states of awareness and states of reality that lie far beyond space time awareness that has profound uh, metaphysical implications profound philosophical implications we we can have access i mean a mystical experience does not a mystic make and that's what basically paraphrasing houston smith and that's true, but a mystical experience does a materialist unmake. <laughs> and, and I think it can undo some of the metaphysical constrictions of our era and open us up to a deeper understanding of what's actually taking place. Once you dissolve into the intelligence of the universe, the intelligence of the mind of the universe, and into the compassionate center of the mind of the universe, it radically transforms your understanding of what life is about, what we are doing here, what the process is. And that has enormous ramifications. And I think we will be moving in that direction. But first, we have to earn the right in a way. We have to earn that access through demonstrating its clinical effect efficacy. I am not a clinician. I'm not a psychologist. I was not primarily interested in uh, healing. I was trained as a philosopher of religion. And I simply could not wait for us to get to this point in time. If I had waited for us to get to this point in time, I would have missed the opportunity of a lifetime. So I did the work I did underground, undercover, privately, quietly. I wish I didn't have to. I wish I could have done it publicly. I wish I could have been in public discussion during all this time. But I did it with the belief, as the early researchers did, that there would come a time when we would reclaim these sacraments and that we would begin to systematically harness their deeper potential. And I think that's where we're going. There is a movement among the pharmaceutical industry that wants to make money off these substances to try to strip the magic out of the mushrooms, you know, to basically extract substances which come from the psychedelic substances, but do not induce some of the more exotic or demanding states of consciousness that these substances do in their natural state so that they can give us a pill, which you can take every day and they can sell us every day. And because psychedelics, you, you can't make money on psychedelics because you don't use enough of them. You know, you only use them intermittently and the healing effect is so powerful that you don't need to take them every day, right? The pharmaceutical industry wants to make money off of them. And I think that's a danger. And that's where we have to really watch that. I also think the medicalization of psychedelics is also a danger. It's understandable that it's important for the scientists to maintain research in these early years. But I think entering into these states of consciousness is a human right. And I don't think it belongs, it doesn't belong under the governance of a, the medical community only. I think we're going to come into a point where we recognize that there is a broader community of specialists who are skilled in navigating these landscapes who are not necessarily uh, MDs and PhDs. Hmm. You know, in the movement, there's various organizations that have formed to be structured around uh, what you call sort of the therapeutic use of psychedelics. And I wonder if in the future there might be institutions structured around the more philosophical or cosmological explorations of the kind that you did, what you imagine those might look like. 
I think it's just a matter of time. I think there will be in the near future, there will be clinics, institutional settings, <clears throat> hopefully deep in nature, uh, settings where people who want to explore the deeper dimensions of their consciousness can go and do so under careful uh, supervision. They can do so safely, there's backup, uh, but they can do it in a non-clinical or non-medical set of expectations. It's kind of like the transition from taking birth out of the hospitals into uh, turning it over to the midwives, where you have medical care nearby if you need it, but birth is not a medical procedure. Birth is an entirely natural procedure. Likewise, opening up into deep levels of your own mind and the mind of the universe is not a medical procedure, even if medical medicine can be very helpful in the early stages. So I would anticipate that there will be organizations, there will be structures, places where you can go to work with sacred medicines, various psychedelics in a safe and effective manner, uh, which go beyond uh, therapeutic healing. Is, I think it's just a matter of time. What kind of affordances might those structures need uh, that might be different from a more like clinical or uh, medical treatment uh, therapeutic usage? Well, <clears throat> first we should recognize that humanity has already been doing this for thousands of years. That there are, uh, in among the indigenous people, among the First Nations peoples, among the, in America, uh, among the indigenous peoples in uh, Brazil or in South America, they've been working ceremonially with sacred substances for hundreds, thousands of years. So we, we have a great deal of historical precedent for how to do this, how to open up not only individuals, but whole communities into sacred space and bring the entire community back and put them through a series of exercises so that they come back grounded, really well grounded into their physical lives. We're, we're not reinventing the wheel here. We really have much to learn from indigenous people and First Nations people on how to work with these substances. Now, there are screening criteria. You, you, you really wanna screen people who are going into these states. There are some people who really should not be entering into these states either because of physical health problems that they're carrying or psychological problems that they're carrying. It's just not a wise procedure to adopt if you're carrying certain tensions within your body and mind. So there, there is a, a place for screening, but the cultures, these indigenous cultures, they knew that. They screened it even if they didn't have MDs screening the process. Okay. So it's simply a matter of building on what we're doing incorporating the collected wisdom from indigenous cultures and uh, moving in to create our own unique forms. Coming back to the sort of vision for humanity writ large, uh, do you have any advice for the coming generations? <clears throat> well, the first thing I would say <clears throat> is that I think we know enough about the universe through reincarnation. If you really do your homework and you really look at the data, if you look at the data from near-death episode research, if you look at the data from out-of-body research, we know enough, just enough to know that we choose our incarnations. Before we were born, we made an informed choice of the life that we were being born into. So at a time when we knew more, and we remember now, we made the choice to live the life that we're living now. Not that we could see every detail, but we, the fundamental core components we could see before we were born. And that means that whether or not we have conscious recall of that choice, I think we have reasons to be confident that we are where we belong as we enter this time in history. That all of us, every one of us has volunteered to participate in this very, very challenging time. So that's the first level It's to be kind of centered in your core and knowing that you don't have to run around and you don't have to go someplace else or do something else 
that you were already planting yourself on a trajectory that allows you to participate in this process. And this process is the process of a transformation of an entire culture. It's going, there is not one person or one type of person or a, a healer or a therapist or artist that's going to make this transition work. It's going to take all of us. It's going to take all the skills that humanity has to make this work. The real question is, I think, not how do we how do we do how do we engage this process meaningfully so we can help us transform the real question is do we have the courage to do which we know we can do what is at hand do we have the courage to really enter into this process consciously and that means we basically have to have the courage to become the future human that we know the world needs. We need to become the human that the world needs in order to survive this crisis. We need to become more compassionate. We need to work to create a culture which is more egalitarian, more fair, more just. We need to show greater respect to the earth and to our the animal cousins who live on this earth with us. We need to basically become in our own personal lives what humanity is trying to forge in our collective life. More where, and that means doing inward practice. It also means doing outward practice of social transformation, clearing out our, our own hearts of anything which keeps us small and helping clean out those things in our culture, which keeps our culture small and focused on values which are destroying the earth. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing that and uh, also for answering all my questions and speaking on so many topics. I, I wonder if there's anything else that you'd like to say or, or talk about. We are coming into a hard time in history. We're coming into a time when decade by decade, things are going to be getting worse and worse. There will be tremendous social anxiety and personal anxiety as we basically inherit the consequences of our abuse of the earth for all the hundreds of years that we've been creating this extractive uh, economy. But I hope in everybody's own individual spiritual practices, one encounters enough of the universe to experience the profound wisdom, the great intelligence that's behind this moment of transformation and the great compassion and love that's behind this time in our history. That this is not, we are not victims. This is not an accident. It is a time that calls for us to become the heroes that we have the possibility of being, that we really nothing less than deep, deep heroic sacrifice and actualization is called for. But the universe will support us every time we make a change to live to the larger good. The universe will support us. It will, uh, it will help us uh, overcome our shortcomings. And this is, uh, you know, this is the game of life. This is the great time of our life. In the end, we don't want to live a comfortable life so much as we want to live a life that's meaningful. And this is going to give us all an opportunity to live very meaningful lives. Mm -hmm. I appreciate you putting that in perspective and uh, speaking so clearly about it. So thank you for that. And thank you as well for your time today. It's, it's been a real pleasure to speak with you. Tazim, thank you for this conversation. Thank you for the conversations you've been having with many people, uh, all focused on helping us know more and become more that we have the possibility of becoming. Mm. Thank you. Mm. You're so welcome. It's a it's an honor and a privilege. So, thank you.